I wish to thank all of the assembled devotees for kindly coming today to help celebrate the Sunday festival for the pleasure of Sri Radha Gopinath. Krishna has so kindly given such pleasing methods in which we can purify our hearts by personally associating with Him. There are several yogic processes often within the scriptures but the topmost is to always remember Krishna and never forget Krishna. Lord Kapila Dev was speaking Sankhya philosophy to his mother Devahuti wherein he is in great detail describing the nature of material elements what is their origin how they have manifested how they are operating and what is the purpose of creation Therein, he explains that all the instructions and injunctures of all the scriptures are subordinate and ultimately helping us to achieve the most important, which is to always remember Krishna and never forget Krishna. To understand the philosophical premise behind this is all important. It is a law of nature that what we associate with we become influenced by those qualities. Just as Srila Prabhupada would often give the example if you put the iron rod in fire it will become red and hot like fire due to association with fire. So what will we associate our consciousness with is what will determine our consciousness. The purpose of human life is purification because the intrinsic nature within every living entity is Krishna Prem, love for Krishna. And that love for Krishna is expressed through devotional service. And it is also realized through devotional service. Srila Prabhupada taught us on the path of bhakti, the end and the means are the same. In other paths, we may perform tapasya, but the goal of a tapasi is not to perform tapasya forever. Yes, people are fasting and giving up sleep and observing strict vows of celibacy and living in freezing cold climates. But is the goal of their life to do that forever? Not at all. They're forsaking so much for a higher purpose. And what is the higher purpose? Perhaps some higher material benefits or liberation from material suffering or some mystic cities and even impersonalists they will worship the deity and they will chant the names of God but what is their goal? ultimately liberation where they never have to do these things again because they enter into that realm beyond duality but the path of bhakti is so sublime. Why? Because we perform devotional service of hearing the glories of the Lord, chanting the names and the glories of the Lord, performing services for the Lord. And what is our goal? To perform these activities forever. It is the nitya dharma. It is sanatan dharma in its purest and highest perfection. 
Dharma means the intrinsic nature of something. The nature of water is liquidity. If you put the water in an unnatural situation of bitter cold, it may become solid. But as soon as it's in a natural climate, irresistibly, it will naturally, spontaneously melt again into water. Yes? You can't take solid ice, bring it in a warm place, and keep it ice. It will melt. Because ice is not the nature of water. The nature of a chili pepper is it is hot. When you eat a good, ripe, red-hot chili, it's going to have a different experience than eating Gokul ice cream. (laughs) Because that is its nature. It's hot. The nature of sugar is it's sweet. We were speaking the other day that the nature of salt is different than the nature of sugar. Although they look the same sometimes. If you mix them up, it will be a very different experience. So what is the nature of consciousness? That is dharma. The nature of our consciousness is to serve. Everyone is serving in every situation in life. We're serving our families, we're serving the government, we're serving our employers, we're serving our employees, we're serving our mind, we're serving our senses, we're serving our ego. At every step we're doing service. But who is it that's serving? That is the eternal soul, the jivatma. The jivatma is the infinitesimal part and parcel of the supreme atma, param brahma. Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. And that is reality. The spirit soul is Brahman. But Krishna is Parabrahman. Nowhere does it say in any scripture, Aham Param Brahma. Aham Brahman, yes, I am spirit. I am eternal, full of knowledge, full of bliss. Arjuna tells Krishna, Param Brahma, Param Dhamma, Pavitra Mitamubha. You are the Supreme Brahman. So what is the difference between Param Brahma and Brahman? Brahman is the infinitesimal part and parcel of the Supreme Brahman, who is Krishna, the complete whole. Om Purnam Adha Purnam Itam. Ishopanishad describes the absolute truth as perfect and complete. And all emanations from the Absolute Truth are also perfect and complete. But the tendency of the infinitesimal part is to love Krishna and serve Krishna. That is the nature of the part, is to serve the whole. So the intrinsic, eternal nature of every spirit soul, wherever there is life, it is the presence of the soul. And the eternal activity, occupation, and propensity of every soul is to serve God with intimate, ecstatic love. However, we have free will. And when we choose to try to enjoy the experience of love separate from Krishna, then we enter into material existence. And then Krishna's external energy, his maya shakti, controls us. The three modes of nature, like ropes, they keep us bound up by various aspirations, We have desires, they induce us to act, and then with every act there will be a reaction, that is karma. And we become so bound up by our karmic activities, and so very, very much conditioned by our relentless desire to enjoy apart from Krishna, that our original nature becomes obscure. We... We have no trace 
of direct cognizance of who we are, who is God, and what is true love. But the Lord is so kind. He descends in this world in so many incarnations. The Gita explains, Yada yada hi dharmasya glanir bhavati bharatam abhyutanam dharmasya tadatmanam srijam yaham but he also incarnates in ways that we can associate with him and become purified at every moment and every day. The Lord appears in the holy name. Kali Kale Namarupe Krishna Vatar. In the age of Kali, Krishna incarnates as the name of Krishna. And Lord Chaitanya prayed, Nam Nam Akari Bahuta Nija Sarvashaktis. All the opulence and powers of the Lord are within the name of the Lord. Why? Because Nama Chintamani Krishna's Chaitanya Ras Vigra. The name of the Lord is like Chintamani. It can fulfill all the innermost soul's desires because it is non-different than Krishna. It is not that Krishna is in his name or that the name is in Krishna. Krishna and the name are identical. With all opulences. Krishna says, as you approach me, I will reveal myself accordingly. Similarly, as we approach the name of God, the name of God will reveal. Reveal himself accordingly. If we chant with faith, without offenses then the name of the Lord will have such a powerful effect, it will purify us of all the previous karmas of all our previous births. Just one recitation of the name of the Lord in an offenseless state of consciousness has that power. Evidence is Ajamil. He just chanted the name of Narayan once without offense, and all of his previous lives of sinful activities were eradicated. Therefore, Lord Chaitanya told, there are nine processes of devotional service. But all the nine processes of devotional service can all be fulfilled and perfected by sincerely chanting the holy names. Of God. Thus, Harinam, 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 Eva Kevalam, Kalo, Nasteva, 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 Gati Rangita. Trinakarta Prabhu, would you like to sit with whatever makes you happy? The name of the Lord is the only way in the age of Kali in which we can attain the supreme perfection of love of God. Through other means, we can, we, can, we can attain some peace of mind. We can become more concentrated in our studies and our work. We can even get mystic powers. There are eight mystic cities. Becoming big, becoming small. <laughs> Traveling. Mystic yogis can jump on the ray of a sun and and on the ray, travel to the sun. Would you like to do that? So many of you could have influence over, you could control people's minds, you can create planets, you can destroy things. Mystic powers are very magical to the ordinary person of the world today. But to a devotee, a mystic yogi showed some cities to Prabhupada. People were very people are very impressed by this. Sometimes they worship such people as God. Prabhupada just looked at him and said, Why don't you give up all this nonsense and surrender to Krishna? Because it's all temporary. So in the age of Kali, if we actually want to attain that state of entering into Goloka Brindavan, entering into the recess of the heart where pure love of God resides, then it is through the chanting of the holy names. 
But the Lord is so kind. He not only comes as his name, but he comes in so many other forms to help us to chant the name of the Lord properly. Krishna Swadhamo Pagate. The Bhagavatam describes that Krishna descends as his literary incarnation in the form of Srimad Bhagavatam. Srimad Bhagavatam is is Radha and Krishna, a deity. When Srila Prabhupada explained that if somebody puts a set of Bhagavatams in their house or even touches or sees it, they become purified because factually it's written right in the Bhagavatam that this Bhagavat Purana is the incarnation of Krishna in the age of Kali. He's non-different. And these beautiful stories just teach us the most exalted virtues of the pure souls, how they react to various circumstances in life, how they pray, how they live. And by following in the footsteps of the great personalities we read about in the Srimad Bhagavatam, we understand the consciousness and the life that we must develop when we chant the holy names. The Lord also appears in the river Ganges and Yamuna to purify our hearts. And one of the most important incarnations of the Lord is the form of the deity. Sri Goranitai, Sri Radha Gopinath, Arche Vishnu Shiladir Gurushu Naramatir Vaishnavi Jati Puddhi. One has hellish mentality if they think that the deity is made of wood or stone, or that the guru is an ordinary person, or that a Vaishnav can be categorized by materialistic caste considerations. That is hellish mentality. Srila Prabhupada gave an example. He was speaking to a particular society of people. One man represented them. And they, they don't believe in deity worship. They believe, they believe in Vedic yagyas, but not deities. So he said to Srila Prabhupada, this is when Prabhupada was in his younger days, he said, why you are you offering deities food? Deities can't eat. <laughs> why you're offering food? Why you're wasting so much time making all these offerings to your deity? Krishna in the form of deity doesn't eat. Patram pushpam palam toyam yome bhakta prayachtit. Ashami. Srila Prabhupada explained that in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Offer me with love and devotion, and I will eat it. So Krishna says he will eat, and you say he won't eat. So who will I believe, Krishna or a loafer like you? <laughs> so that was the end of the debate. So Prabhupada explained that Krishna is the source of everything. Everything is his energy. He has basically three energies. The uh, spiritual energy, the marginal energy, and the material energy. But all emanations are, all, all energies are emanating from him. And therefore he can manifest through his own energies according to his wish. If Krishna wants to appear in stone, in his personal, direct, original form, to accept our, our love, how can we say he can't? He is Abhigya and Swarat. He is completely independent. Nothing is impossible for him. He has a chintya shakti, inconceivable potencies. So we read in the scriptures and we see in the lives of the great Acharyas since time immemorial how they're worshipping the deity, how they're seeing the deity, how they're loving the deity, and how the deity is reciprocating with them people who do not have such advanced understanding think that deity worship is idol worship. Why? Because in so many places people are in fact doing idol worship. In unauthorized ways, they just in superstitious ways or just, you know, untraceable traditions, they just create some idol and 
They worship it for material purposes or to put curses on other people. And in the West, this type of idol worship without any philosophy, with any sci without any spiritual scientific background was rampant. So when religious reformers of the West said abolish idol worship, that was good. But the scientific, pure process authorized by God in the scriptures of the worship of the deity, Archa Vigraha, Puja, that cannot be in any way related to idol worship. That is the worship of the Supreme Lord who is so kind, who is so merciful. He appears in a way that we can dress him. We can see him. We can pray to him. We can put our whole hearts, complete focus and attention in serving him and loving him. And through that process, we become purified. And in that state of consciousness, it deepens and deepens our disposition of devotion and thus helps us to have the proper service attitude, to have the proper focus of the Lord in our heart as we chant the Holy Name. In our holy scriptures, there are many wonderful examples of how the deity of the Lord is reciprocating with his devotee. And they are written in the scriptures so that we can have faith. So that with that faith, we can worship the beautiful form of the Lord, chant the names of the Lord, hear the glories of the Lord, associate with the devotees of the Lord, and become purified and our intrinsic, original, spiritual nature to love Krishna will awaken. To surrender to Krishna is so sweet. The concept of surrender is not like we think in the battlefield where you lose and you surrender, or in the cricket match when you lose and you surrender. Surrender to God is the sweetest expression of our free will. It is an act of love. It is the most pleasing experience in all of creation to surrender our heart, our body, mind, words, and life to the will of God. There's nothing that can compare to it. Sarvadharman purutya jyamam ekam sharanam braja aham tvam sarvapapebhyo moksha yishami masaja and as we surrender to Krishna, we give our hearts to Krishna, and Krishna gives himself proportionately to us. And we become purified. Krishna tells, if you surrender, I will relieve you of all sinful reactions, of all previous births for all time. But relieving of sinful reactions is only what Haridas Thakur said, it is just the beginning. Just like before the sun rises, there is light in the sky. So before the appearance of ecstatic love of God, before that sun rises on the horizon of our hearts, all the darkness of ignorance due to all our past conditionings is eliminated. And we become, our hearts become illuminated with joy. Today I shall tell a story, with your permission, of how the Lord reciprocates in his deity form with devotee. Narottam Das Thakur, Srinivasacharya, and Shamanand Prabhu. They lived in Vrindavan. And Sri Jiva Goswami sent them to Bengal with the very precious sacred books that were written by Rupa Goswami, Sanatan Goswami, Raghunath Das Goswami, Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami, and others, as well as Jeev Goswami's books. But they were stolen in a place called Ban Vishnupur. 
Srinivasacharya stayed back to find them, but sent Narottam Das Thakur and Shamananda Prabhu to their uh, native places to try to share this glorious message of Lord Chaitanya with the people. So they went to Ketri Gram, where Santosh Dutt, the cousin brother of Narottam Das Thakur, was now the king. And he surrendered to Narottam Das Thakur and offered the whole kingdom to use all the facilities to promote pure love of God. After some time, they received the news from Srinivasacharya that the books had returned to him. And Narottam Das Thakur bid Shamananda farewell. Shamananda Goswami, he left Ketri. And on his way to Utkala, or Orissa, where he resides, he stopped in various places. One place he went was Kantakanagar, or Katwa, where he saw the beautiful deity of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that was worshipped by Gadadhar Das. And then he went to the place of his Guru Maharaj, Ambika Kalna, where there are beautiful deities of Gornitai that were originally worshipped by Gori Das Pandit. Gori Das Pandit is explained in the Gorganodesh Dipika to be the most intimate loving friend of Krishna in Goloka Vrindavan, Subal. The Bhakti Samrita Sindhu explains the qualities of Subal. One verse tells that he has an effulgent golden complexion, very much like that of Srimati Radharani. Beautiful, beautiful lotus-like eyes. He wears a celestial necklace and yellow garments. Subal is Krishna and Balaram's very, very best friend. In fact, all the different types of leelas and rasas of Krishna's exchanges, Krishna invites Subal to participate. Subal is Krishna's very, very constant companion. And even a moment, even in his dreams, Subal is always hand-to-hand with Krishna. He is a very special category of gopa, very unique, where Subal will arrange meetings between Radha and Krishna. When Srimati Radharani is in separation from Krishna, or when Krishna is in separation from Srimati Radharani, he will send Subal to bring her to meet him. Sometimes he will put flower bed with his own hands within a kunja. And when Radha and Krishna sit in that flower bed, he will personally fan them with a peacock fan that he makes with his own hands. Gorgonodeshtapika tells that that same Subal has appeared in Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Leela as Goridas Pandit. So we should know this in order to properly understand the beautiful pastimes that Gauri Das Pandit has performed. He was the brother of Surakela, uh, Surya Das Sarakela. And they lived in a village called Saligram. But Gauri Das, wanting to live on the bank of the Ganges, asked his older brother's permission to live in Ambika Kalna. And there... He was such intimate, loving friends with Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda. He would constantly sing their names and glories. He couldn't bear separation from them. One day, Lord Chaitanya, he visited Shantipur, and then by himself, he took a boat and rode the boat across the Ganges to Harinadi, and from there he went to Ambika Kalna. Gauridas Pandit was 
sitting in a secluded place in the ecstasies of separation from the Lord. So Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu still had the oar that he used to row across the Ganges in his hand. And he said to Goridas, he said, this oar can carry all of mankind across the ocean of material existence. You take it and keep it with you. Very powerful statement. Lord Chaitanya and Goridas spent nice time together. And then Lord Chaitanya said, you come with me and we will go to Nadia. So they traveled together and for many days Lord Chaitanya included Goridas Pandit in his pastimes on Nadia amongst his associates where day and night they were congregational chanting the holy names. Before sending Gauri Das Pandit home, Lord Chaitanya gave him a Bhagavad Gita that the Lord personally copied the beautiful Sanskrit verses with his own hands. And Gauri Das took that and every day he would spend hours and hours in transcendental ecstasy reading that Bhagavad Gita even before he would read it, just seeing the handwriting of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, his eyes would fill with tears and ecstatic love. In this way, Goridas lived. But it was very difficult because a moment of, of separation from Gorni Tai for Goridas Pand, it seemed like forever. So he was almost constantly in a state of of sorrow in his love. So Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda understood his heart. Now Narahari Chakravarti explains in this way. There are other versions of this story, but this is what is in the scripture Bhakti Ratnakar. That Lord Chaitanya one time told Gauri Das that I know your mind. I know you cannot bear even a moment without seeing Nityananda Prabhu and myself. Therefore, I am going to give you some wood from Navadweep. And I want you, with your own hands, to carve deities of Gornitai. And don't have any reservations of whether you can carve or not. Because I will manifest myself personally along with Nord Nityananda Prabhu through that wood. All you have to do is just start carving. So Lord Chaitanya gave him the wood from Navadweep and Neem wood and he began to carve and miraculously as he was carving the beautiful forms of Gorni Tai manifested from the wood. And then he called, you know, the local devotees to come for the installation ceremony. And when they saw the beauty of Gorni Tai, they understood that these are self manifested deities. They weren't simply carved by the hands of a man. This was Subal of Krishna's Leela with his ecstatic love just carving the wood and Gorni Tai, irresistible in reciprocation to his love, just manifested their forms as deities. Isn't this wonderful? People were amazed to see the beauty of Gorni Tai in Ambika Nagar. And there was Kirtan and Abhishekam and after that, day and night, Gauri Das Pandit was worshipping those deities because he understood with full realization that they were non different than the Lord. It wasn't just his faith, it was his experience. 
when he would cook, he would see the Lord eat it. He would eat all the food and just leave a little remnants. One time, Gori Das, he would always cook huge feasts, every offering. And he would make several every day. He would make so many preparations in every one in large quantities. And he would work really, really hard to please the Lord. And the Lord was so pleased that right in front of his eyes, Lord Shaitanya and Lord Nityananda Prabhu would eat. Haribo! And he would be in ecstatic love, weeping and crying, seeing that they're accepting my love, my devotion. They're so merciful. But one day, the deities just remained still and silent. They didn't eat. So Goridas became angry out of love. He said, if you are not satisfied eating this food, then why did you force me to work so hard to cook it? And then Lord Chaitanya responded. He said, we have told you so many times, we're satisfied with just a little. There's no reason for you to cook so many preparations in such very, very large quantities. It causes us pain to see you suffer so much through your hard work and labor every single day. Just cook a little for us and we'll be happy. Whatever's simple, just do it. You don't have to work so hard. And Goridas responded, All right, then from, from this day I'll just give you a little bit of boiled rice and some boiled sak or boiled shukta. Huh? And after hearing him speak, Gornitai ate the whole offering. Large quantities. With great happiness they ate. In this way, Goridas Pandit defeated the Lord. He would work so hard for those deities. He would make so many preparations and such large quantities just for the satisfaction. And the deities reciprocated by manifesting. They didn't just eat with their glance. They sat down and ate it all. Another time, Gauri Das Pandit, because he was a very simple person, he was thinking, I would like to decorate Sri Sri Nithai Gorachandra with beautiful ornaments, but I don't know how to do it. The Lord knew his mind. He came into the deity room and was astounded by what he saw. Nithai Gorachandra were standing before him, decorated. They decorated themselves. <laughs> they manifested precious jewels inlaid in gold and silver. They manifested and dressed themselves with the most costly, opulent ornaments. just for the pleasure of their devotee because he wanted to see them in that way. And Goridas saw that and his eyes were flooded with torrents of tears. And he was in ecstasy. And when he finally came back to external consciousness, the deities were dressed in their normal way. So Goridas Pandit was thinking, now I know how to worship the Lord. I was just thinking and the Lord has revealed to me how he wants me to worship him. And then the deity spoke. Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda spoke to him. He said, the type of ornaments that please us most is ornaments made out of not jewels, but flowers. So from that day on, Gauri Das Pandit would make beautiful, beautiful garden, garlands that would go from the neck of Gornitai all the way to their feet in beautiful ornaments made out of flowers and garlands knowing that those are the kinds of ornaments that pleases Krishna the best. One day, very early in the morning, Goridas Pandit visited Gadadhar Pandit. Gadadhar Pandit was so happy to see a Vaishnava. 
He said, oh, Gauri Das, today, this is very, very good for me. It is my good fortune that I am seeing you. You have come. And Gauri Das Pandit replied, actually, I have come for my own good fortune. And Gadadhar Pandit said, whatever pleases you, I will do. Please tell me how I can serve you, how I can please you. And Gauri Das Pandit said, I have a prayer. I do want something from you. And Gadadhar Pandit replied, whatever is here is your property. There is nothing that I have that I will not give you. Ask for anything. And Gauri Das said, I want Hridayananda. So, Gadadhar Pandit called for Hridayananda. Hridayananda was one of his students. And Hridayananda came and offered his obeisance at the feet of both of his lords, Gadadhar Pandit and Gauri Das Pandit. And then Gadadhar Pandit dedicated Hridayananda to the feet of Gauri Das Pandit. Which was very special. Because from his early childhood, Hridayananda was such a loving devotee, he took shelter of Gadadhar Pandit's lotus feet. And therefore Gadadhar Pandit raised this child and taught him the holy scriptures from his early childhood. Now he was a young man. And the affection that Gadadhar Pandit had for this Sri Dayananda was so immense. But still, when Gauri Das Pandit said, I need his help, immediately Gadadhar Pandit said, yes, he is yours. So for a long time, Gauri Das Pandit and Gadadhar Pandit discussed topics about Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda and performed the Sankirtan of the chanting of the holy names. And afterward, Gauri Das Pandit, along with Hridayananda, went back to Ambika Kalna. There, after some time, Gauri Das Pandit gave Diksha, mantra initiation, to Hridayananda. And after initiating him, he, he gave, entrusted him service to the deities of Nitai Gaurachandra. One day, Gauri Das Pandit said to Hridayananda that very soon, Gaur Purnima, the Lord's birthday is approaching. I want to have a wonderful festival for the deities. So I am going to travel village to village to the various of my disciples' homes to beg for some provisions to conduct this festival. You should take care of the deities in my absence, but do so very, very carefully. Now, Gauri Das Pandit was such an ecstatic person. He went village to village and he visited his disciples and he was preaching to them and having Harinam Kirtan with them and he was meeting other great Vaishnavas and they would go together in some secluded place and they would just enlighten one another. Much chita, much gata, prana, bodhiyanta parasparam, katiyantashchamam nityam tushyanti charamanti cha. This is Gita teaching. That when my devotees come together, they derive great, great satisfaction and bliss conversing about me, chanting my glories. So many days passed. And there was only a couple days until the Lord's birthday was coming, the festival. And Hridayananda was thinking that Gurudev has not returned yet. I don't know what to do. He's not giving me any, or, any more orders it just, except just take care of the deities. He's going to be getting all the provisions, but the fact is, without even asking, all the provisions have just come right to the temple. We have everything we need right here for a wonderful festival. And Gurudev has not returned yet. I don't know where he is. And has he invited anybody? I don't know. So meditating on the lotus feet of his spiritual master, 
Hridayananda sent invitations to all the devotees in the area. And one day before the festival, Goridas Pandit arrived. And Hridayananda told him that, you know, you went for provisions, but somehow provisions have come. And not knowing your desire, I... I sent invitations to all Vaishnavas. <laughs> and although Gauri Das Pandit from the core of his heart was very, very happy by his disciples' enthusiasm, he pretended to be angry just to teach his disciple a good lesson. And in his pretended anger situation, he spoke. He said, while your guru is still living on this earth, you have acted independently? This is not a disciple. Therefore, I will not be a part of your festival. So, Vridayananda, this, after getting chastised by his Gurudev, he went to the bank of the Ganges where he would, he would sleep under a tree on bank of Ganga. So he went there, was doing his bhajan. Soon so many guests and great mahants were coming to Goridas Pandit's temple and he was taking care of them so nicely. These are the people he invited. But the people Sri Dayananda invited were coming to the bank of the Ganges to, <laughs> to where he was. And during this time, one very, very wealthy man came with a boat with all kinds of very, very nice provisions for the festival and said, I want to offer this to you. So there was very, very big stock of food and decorations and flowers and everything. So being very humble, uh, Hridayananda sent a messenger to his Gurudev saying, I have all this very, very wonderful um, boga and, and other facilities for the festival. You know, can I bring them to you? And Gauri Daspana was very happy, but he pretended to be angry. He said, I don't want it. You have your own festival with it. So this was the order of his guru. You have your own festival with it. So he had his own festival. <laughs> and there was one festival going on at the temple and another festival going on at the bank of the Ganges. And Hridayananda had the, the, so many devotees came to his festival and they all started chanting Harinam Sankirtan. And as they were chanting, they were feeling the presence of Gornitai so deeply in their hearts. They were chanting the glories of Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda with so much devotion. And they were dancing in circle. All the devotees were dancing in a circle. And the the kol or murdanga and the kartals and the voices of all the devotees literally filled the entire sky. And hearing the loving chant of Hridayananda and the Vaishnavas, Lord, all of a sudden, right in the middle of the circle where all the, in which the devotees were chanting, Gornitai appeared. And when they saw Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda dancing with exquisite beauty, their eyes were like lotus flowers. It was so beautiful. So beautiful. They were smiling and loudly chanting the holy names. All the devotees were weeping tears of ecstasy to see Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda in their midst dancing. It was a tumultuous kirtan. And Gauri Das heard the kirtan and he understood that this is a kirtan of ecstasy. But it was time for the offering. Time for the arti actually. So he told his pujari, whose name was Ganga Das, he said, Ganga Das, now you go and perform the arti to Gaur Nithai Gora Chandra. So he opened the doors 
and there were no deities. So he was really alarmed. He ran back to Gauri Das Pandit and said, there's no deities on the altar. And Gauri Das Pandit could understand. He looked down to the bank of the Ganges and he saw all the devotees loudly, loudly chanting the holy names. And right in the midst of all of them was Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Lord Nityananda Prabhu dancing in ecstatic love, just showering the whole universe with their beauty and grace. Oh, he was so happy. He was so happy from the core of his heart. Gauri Das Pandit was rejoicing. He was thinking that my disciple, Sri Dayananda, has bound up Gorni Tai with his love and forced them to enter into the kirtan and dance with them. But he pretended to be angry <laughs> and picked up a stick and went down to punish Gorni Tai for leaving the altar. So during this kirtan, Everyone was very, very much in bliss. And all of a sudden, Gauri Das Pandit approaches with a stick in his hand. Should I continue? (laughs) And when, when Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda saw Gauri Das coming with a stick to discipline them, they became transcendentally afraid. And what happened? Lord Nityananda Prabhu and Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu both in a very secretive way went back to the temple. But Gauri Das Pandit saw Lord Chaitanya also just to hide from Hridai Ch- just to hide from Gauri Das Pandit. He jumped into the heart of Hridayananda. When Goridas saw this, he was astounded. He could actually see with his eyes Lord Chaitanya hiding in the heart of Hridayananda. His eyes couldn't even blink. He was just gazing in ecstatic love at the Lord within the heart of his disciple. Tears were profusely falling from his eyes. His entire body was trembling in ecstasy, so much so that he dropped his stick and he didn't even know it. And then when he came to consciousness, in supreme ultimate happiness, he said to Sri Dayananda that you are the most fortunate. On this day, I give you the name Hridai Chaitanya. Because Lord Chaitanya is forever revealing himself within your heart. And then Gauri Das Pandit just reached out his arms and embraced Hridai Chaitanya and soaked him, literally bathed his disciple with his tears. And Hridai Chaitanya, in, in, in great humility, just fell at his Gurudev's feet and prayed for mercy. Gauri Das Pandit then brought Hridai Chaitanya back to the temple. And Gauri Das saw that the deities of Gornitai had an extraordinary effulgence that day. Why? Because they were so pleased dancing and chanting with Hridai Chaitanya. So Gauri Das Pandit with great, great happiness entrusted the full worship of Nitai Gaur Chandra to Hridai Chaitanya. And then the festival of Gaur Purnima continued. And what a wonderful festival it was. What a glorious festival it was. It cannot be explained.
There is another story. For one time, Gauri Das Pandit, who was Subal in Krishna's Leela, was worshipping his deities. And he turned around. He was doing some seva for Takwarji. And all of a sudden, Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda spoke to him. He said, Oh, Gauri Das! He said, Can you remember your first birth? Can you remember your birth as Subal? Can you remember how we would have so much fun together taking care of our cows in the bank of the Yamuna? And Goridas heard this voice and he turned around. And when he turned around, he saw that the deities of Gornitai had transformed into Krishna Balaram. Lord Nityananda Prabhu, that beautiful golden form of Nitai, assumed the complexion of a newly formed spring cloud. He was wearing blue garments and a blue turban. He was holding a plow and, hold, and a club. And he had a cowherd boy stick and a buffalo horn. And he was decorated with beautiful flowers from Brudges Forest and peacock feathers. And he looked at Lord Chaitanya and his beautiful golden form became darkish like the tamal tree. And he had magnificently exquisite lotus-like eyes gazing upon him. He had a bright yellow garment, Vajayanti Mala, extending below his knees of various forest flowers. And he was holding a cowherd stick and he had a buffalo horn and he had flute in his hands and peacock feathers and flowers decorating. When Gauri Das saw this, he fell into very, very deep sentiments of pure love. And when he came out of his trance, again, Krishna Balaram became Gornitai. So he's, these are some of the beautiful stories of how Krishna reciprocates with the love of his devotee. And how the deity in the temple is so specially eager to reciprocate with our love. Prabhupada explains, if you take one step toward Krishna, Krishna will take ten steps toward you. And Krishna, who has unlimited love, he is vibhu, he is unlimited, therefore his love is unlimited. And he has the capacity to unlimitedly love every living entity. We are infinitesimal. But our love for Krishna is oceanic. But it is only a particle of Krishna's capacity. But yet Krishna is so merciful, so kind, that even when we're in this world in a conditioned state, Krishna wants us to come back to Godhead more than we could ever want to come. Therefore, he descends in so many ways, in so many times, in so many places, just to attract our hearts back to him. But we're stubborn and foolish. We're in a prison. And Krishna descends and sends his representatives, his devotees, and the scriptures, and the name, and the deities, and the Bhagavats, in so many ways. Come, just take shelter. But we don't have time. We're preoccupied. Let me just finish this first, then I will do. No, that's devotee. Most people are so immersed in trying to enjoy the sources of miseries, of material enjoyment. They're not willing to reciprocate with the Lord's love. Krishna's bhakta vatsal. He's so favorable. He's so loving to his devotees. In fact, he's conquered. He's conquered by the sincere efforts of those who worship him with love. Rupa Goswami explains, pure devotional service is very rare. Why is it so rare? Because it conquers Krishna. 
because Krishna agrees to be under the control of his devotee who worships him with love. Therefore, he only gives that love to those who are very sincere. And that was Prabhupada's message to us. Just be sincere. Just try to hear the glories and the teachings of Krishna with sincerity. Just try to chant the names with sincerity. Just try to serve the Lord with sincerity. If we just make that sincere effort, Ananyas chinta yanto mam yeja na paryupashate tetam nitya biyuktanam yoga kshemam bahamya. Krishna will preserve whatever little we have and he will carry what we lack. If we just make that sincere effort to surrender, to offer our hearts to Krishna. It's so easy. But in our conditioned state, it appears so difficult. Do any of you have this experience? One person has this experience. It's very difficult. Because we're so complicated, our ego has made our lives so complex with so many artificial priorities in life, the simplest thing becomes so difficult to do. But if we just honestly, earnestly try, Krishna will give us all help. Just try to be noble and honest and sincere in chanting Harinam, serving the Vaishnavas, and carrying out the order of Guru and Goranga. And Krishna will give all help. Because the fact is, His love is so sweet that He desires us to go back to Godhead millions of times more than we could want to go back to Godhead. But until He sees within our little tiny hearts that longing that greed to hear about Him, that greed to serve Him, that greed to love Him. He will not give it. But if He just sees that we have that desire, that lobha, then He will give us everything. So this should be our prayer. That more than anything else, we should with humility and sincerity, we should want to please Krishna and love Krishna as the servant of the servant of his servants, more than anything else. And little gestures are never forgotten by Krishna. Whatever little we do, Krishna will never forget. Krishna told that, I mean, Prabhupada told that one devotee, because you have chanted the name of Krishna once sincerely in the land of Vrindavan, Krishna will save you. Even if you fall away in so many ways, Krishna will never forget that you called out His name with sincerity. Krishna will never forget whatever service we have done. He's waiting for us. He will orchestrate in such a way to give us the chance. But we have to take the chance. We have to take the opportunity and offer our hearts, our body, our minds, our words on the path of, of the perfection of yoga, devotional service. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So when we come before the deity in the temple, Shri Shri Radha Gopinath, Shri Shri Radha Raspihari, Shri Radha Giridhari, Prabhupada's mercy, many temples are here in Bombay. And you may have deities in your own homes. And there's Nitai Gora Chandra Gopal. See it as it is. They're not just idols, just that we come according to our convenience and just offer some superstitious prayers and hope for the best. This is Radha and Krishna. Krishna is playing his flute and Srimati Radharani is standing. They are inviting us into their eternal lila of love, their eternal lila of pleasure. They're coming to, ex 
they've appeared in these beautiful, wonderful forms to accept our service and in doing so accept our hearts. And Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda, these deities have appeared with their arms raised, dancing in Harinam Sankirtan to accept our love and devotion, which is most wonderfully offered when we come together as a wonderful spiritual family and we raise our arms to chant the holy name. Shila Prabhupada Kija Ananti Koti Vaishna Brinda Kija Gauranitai Kija Shidadha Gopinath Dev Kija Shigopal Ji Kija Gopimanandi Now we will perform Hadinam Sankirtan for the pleasure of their lordships.